Today, I'm joined by David Ankin, CEO and host of Toy Makers. Welcome, David. How are you guys? All right. So, you know, you have a few nicknames such as the Doghouse and the Iron Man. So you have to tell us about that. You know, honestly, Doghouse was something that started a long time ago. I, I, I thought I was going to retire by a bar and relax. The name of the bar was Doghouse. So uh, it became Doghouse Dave. Uh, the Iron Man actually isn't my nickname. It was my father's. My father grew up uh, working with anything with steel, iron, it didn't matter. And they called him the Iron Man long before the Iron Man superhero came out. And he was just known to be able to build anything with his hands with steel. And they called him the Iron Man. So Beautiful story. So I, I got to believe when you were growing up, you must have had opportunities to work in the shop alongside your dad. Can you share a little bit about that? You know, you're absolutely right. Growing up, one of my favorite memories was my, my, my grandfather worked for Studebaker and Packard. So I got to go spend two weeks with him every summer and wait. I'd pack weeks and weeks in advance to go spend it with my grandfather. And then, of course, my father worked with cars and metal and steel and fabrication shops of all different varieties. So in the summer, babysitting for me was going to his shop and using a primer gun or moving metal around the shop or cutting stuff up. I don't think I ever actually did anything. I think he gave me jobs to do to keep me occupied, but I loved it so much. And you learn so much when you stand around a fabrication shop or a metal shop or a wrought iron shop and just play with a paint gun, for instance, and primer stuff. And tinker with stuff. My dad always was, a, and to this day, he's a hands-on man. Well, I think the love of tinkering, the love of building things with your hands is so gratifying because it's not just virtual, it's actually physical and you can actually have an end result to it. You know, there's no question. My son does the same thing. Um, anytime, and unfortunately in today's society, we teach people to buy things and throw it away. Mm. I was raised in a generation, you buy things, you maintain things, you fix things, you keep them forever. So I love the idea of taking something apart, fixing it, putting it back together. I love the idea of building something from nothing. Um, I think it's it's in my gene pool for some reason. Uh, the gratification of, of, of somebody saying you can't do something or it can't be fixed um, is, um, is, is, is amazing to me. You know, when you go to places like Cuba or certain parts of South America, for instance, and even Mexico for that matter, you know, because they're constantly dealing with constraints, whether it's financial resources or even parts, you know, they learn to figure out how to manufacture components for their cars and reuse and reuse and then keep those cars running for decades. You know, and, and that's something I, I wish we did more of here, but that that's exactly what I'm talking about. There's 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 countries, there's people, the, the backyards even here, it's amazing the talent that's out there, that they can take something from nothing. They don't have money, it ain't about money. It's about ingenuity, it's about mm. thinking outside the box. It's mm. about making something happen because you have to, it's a necessity. I, I love everything about that. And I treat my life the same way. That, that's a really great topic. Matter of fact, there's a Forbes article that's coming out uh, at the time of this recording uh, where it's going to be talking about does constraints actually help or hurt innovation? And in this case, what you're saying is the right level of constraints or limitations actually forces you to be much more creative. So great. You know uh, uh, let's get into a little bit about your background. Um, you know, you've been a uh, stunt rider, race car driver, stunt man. Uh, tell us about your cra one of your craziest stunt that you've ever done, and how did you make it out alive? You know. I think that's life. I think that's doing television. I think that's a family. I think that's, you know, for me, that's what I've done my whole life. So for me to go do a crazy stunt or go 200 miles an hour, do something crazy is just a, a way of life for me. That's not the crazy side of my life. The crazy side of my life is, is doing a television show. Probably the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Hmm. The most rewarding I've ever done. You got to deal with people. You got to deal with vendors. You got to deal with all kinds of scenarios. A, a stunt, doing something, usually when I would roll into a stunt, I have so much confidence in the vehicle we built, the safety care that we have, the, the preparation going into it, it really isn't that hectic. I've had a few go wrong, don't get me wrong. I've been in the hospital, they detached my head, replaced three and four, the disc, put you know a couple vertebrae back together, put my head back on my shoulders. Um, things happen, but things happen 
you know, in life. I mean, to me, the hardest part of, and, and the biggest growth I've ever had is perseverance, is working hard, is, is really understanding that you have to work hard. You have to put in all, anything I would do to do a stunt, you have to do in life. You got to work hard. You got to make a good game plan. You got to faith in what you're doing. You got to believe in what you're doing and you can get it done. Stunt stuff was the easy stuff. Yeah, you make a, a tremendous point because, you know, when the audience sees your stunt, they just see maybe a few minutes of that stunt. What they don't see are essentially hundreds, if not even thousands of preparation, practice, safety checks, all the things that you built around it. And then, of course, the practice runs that, that leads to that particular stunt. So it, it, it's a day in and day out. It's a grind and the willingness to strive for that perfection so that when you're at the point of stunt or on film, you're at your best. You know, you bring up a, a, another good point. That's where I say television was the hardest thing. Mm. If I'm doing a stunt in, in, a, in a crazy plan, it's planned out for sometimes a year, year and a half, really well thought out. TV isn't that way. Mm. So what happens is when I'm doing TV, you got X amount of days to build the car, X amount of days to prepare the car, to safety the car, for me to get ready. Sometimes the first time somebody sees me in that car on television is the first time I got in the driver's seat. So now all of a sudden, I've got, I'm an old man. So I got all these years of experience. I got a heck of a team. I got an amazing team. So I have to have faith that everything we just did is right. I have to have faith that all my years of experience shooting a car, riding a bike, or doing whatever I do is right. Because the first time you see me on camera in a car on TV is the first time I was ever in that car. First time I spun the tires. The first time I slid it around the corner. So the challenges are completely different than if I was doing what I've done my whole life. And it's the hardest thing I've ever done because there has been some mishaps. You get throttles stick wide open, you get brakes failure, and you got camera guys that you can't hit them. You know, they're expecting you to go 200 miles an hour and buzz them in inches. And if you have a problem, they know not to move. So it's my job not to hit them. And it's the first time usually I'm in that car. So it's a completely different dynamic now. I, I'm, I'm speechless because in uh, software development, we talk about agile uh, processes, which is this notion of compressing and doing things very quickly. But where it's different for what you're doing is that when you're compressing the time frame to build essentially a brand new vehicle um, and be able to actually do extreme stunt with it at the end of it, you know, that puts you in a very precarious situation. So... Yeah. That, that takes not only faith, but I think what, it's, what, it, what you're talking about is each of those team members, including yourself, have the years of experience that allow for them to know exactly how to uh, deliver quickly but ensure quality. And Let me tell you something. People wonder why I have a very, very small crew. I have a small crew that understands me. I understand every inch of them. Nobody ever in this house right here ever has a problem asking a question. Or, or if something isn't quite right. They know that it isn't, the four or five people people see on TV is a small group of the 50 people based around me making this show. So it isn't even just my safety, it's everybody else's, it's sound guys, it's camera guys, it's DPs, it's, it's so incredible that, that the team around, you're, you're exactly right, that the faith and the experience I have in my team, I put them against anybody on the planet. And at the same time, I know when I strap my butt in a car, I know it's right. I know it's right. And if I didn't know it, I will not roll out of this show. Well, I think uh, this is a really tremendous uh, point that you're making, which is that any great project, company, anything really requires the cohesion of that team, that leadership team, and the people that's involved. It's a trust. It's the way everyone works with each other, knows what to expect, and executes. Now, you guys are into your fourth successful season of Filmmakers, right? You yes, mentioned sir. before the start of this uh, call that there's a spinoff as well. Tell us about that. Yeah, very few people know about it. Matter of fact, we've been meeting really hard. Uh, the end of this month, we're actually filming the, the first episode of it or what they call a chapter. It's uh, 
really going to be really cool. We're, 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 the spinoff is basically of all digital platforms. So we're taking the TV shows behind the scenes. The digital side and the spinoff is all done fake. So we're using real cars, real 200 mile an hour stuff, real big inch. Instead of being movie cars where it's done uh, with fake and dollies and we're not. We're using real cars, real stunt drivers, no CG, very amazing. But the characters, like, I'm not going to be David Ankin anymore. There's a character based out of another shop, and it's going to be my shop. So if you watch the TV show, it's really going to be cool. You'll know the behind the scenes. If you watch just the digital series, it looks like a movie, and people don't realize it's just you're just entertained by the movie. And if you happen to be a fan of both, you get behind the scenes and then uh, the front side watching a, a great movie with incredible cars. We're going to live in six different genres from drag racing, street racing, monster trucks, motorcycles, road racing. It's going to be absolutely insane what we're doing this year. Well, I love the fact that you guys have been very thoughtful about curating it, uh, classifying, categorizing it so that no matter who you are and what your interest uh, is, you can actually you know, go to the specific set of genre that's appropriate for them and be able to yeah. consume it in any which way on any devices that they want. So I, I love that uh, digitization. Yeah, I do too. I'm really excited about the future where we're going. Good. Now for most that are watching, especially those uh, have similar background like yours, uh, it's gotta be a kind of a dream come true to work and be able to share uh, what you do with millions of viewers. Now you mentioned that TV is really one of the hardest aspects, but also tell us about what's the most gratifying about working on TV. Listen, you know, we don't we don't talk a lot about what we do behind the scenes, okay? But let me tell you something. When you can talk to kids in the future of our country and in, in, in our future of, of our sports, uh, working with kids every day, the people that come by the shop. I, I'm out, I do roughly 30 events a year. Um, mm. I'm always gone. I'm at an event, I'm at a drag race, I'm at a road race, I'm at a drift event. I'm at a, a, a car show. When you can go out there and talk to these people, they see your vehicles, touch your vehicles, hear your vehicles, and you can make them sort of, I'm a very passionate man about what I do. All these people are passionate about the things they do. When you can sit there and turn them people and, and make them really appreciate it, or this year I happen to take a bunch of people and put them on my show, I took fans. And when you can take a fan and make a dream come true, I dealt with Richard Petty this year. I had a fan that's been a lifelong fan of Richard Petty, been to every race Richard Petty ever had. Never got to meet Richard Petty, really meet him. Got an autograph or two. Now he's into some money and asked me if, he, if I'd build a car. What he didn't know is Richard Petty's down the street. I built the car, put it in Richard Petty's shop. As a tour, when he got here, he said, hey, let's go down to Richard Petty and look at his garage since where the guy was ecstatic. What he didn't realize, Richard Petty come out and handed him the keys to his car in Richard Petty's museum. That's a dream come true for me to make other people's dream come true, let alone the people around me. Think about my staff, the 50 people that nobody sees. When I can grow their careers and bring all my friends along, good Lord's blessed me with a, an amazing show and an amazing ability and surrounded me with the right people. I wanna bring everybody with me. That's the gratification I can do. When somebody calls me and I know their business is struggling, I said, let's get you on the show. Let's do something with you. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's, that's amazing. And, and it, it, it's something like I've never felt before. Well, we may have to add another nickname to your uh, collection, which is, I think, Dream Maker. I mean, the fact that you're inspiring young people and the people around you to do this and be able to actually aspire to something great in this art form. So I think that's tremendous. You've had many successes, of course, and building exotic rare toys is incredible, exceptional. We've been talking a lot about behind the scene. Tell us something that you haven't shared already around your biggest innovation failure and what lesson did you learn from it? You know, I, I, I have a little different stance than most on this. I think everything in life, you know, if you're going to go racing, you're going to fail. To, you've got to crash to go fast. You have to fail to succeed. You, Nothing's handed to anybody. Uh, everything I do, there's been failures in it. You have to fail to succeed. It's okay to fail. So TV is the same thing. Year one is not nearly as good as, as year, year four is going to be. Um, but in saying that, you know, I, I've 
you, you can have the best laid plan. You're going to build my first one-off car. You buy nothing off the shelf. Failed miserably because in my mind, I could make 300 parts work together that I developed the 300 parts. That sounds easy. It's really not easy. And, but in, instead of letting that take me down, now I do one a year. I build one car a year from the ground up where we build the window, the body, the chassis, the suspension, the fuel tanks, the seats. We don't buy a seat. You build the seat and put it in the car. That's the biggest undertaking I've ever taken. And to fail a million times making all them pieces work together where somebody like GM or Porsche or Ferrari have spent years developing and teams of people developing that skill to make it work and work right. We've developed it and made it work, but there's been a bunch of failures, you know, because, and, and you have to fail to succeed. You're just because I think it's going to work doesn't mean it's going to work. The, the engineering that goes behind it is amazing. It's okay to fail. You have to fail to succeed. Great sagacious advice. Thank you so much, David. Now, my last uh, question is, um, how can people get a hold of uh, you as well as for your work? You know, all of the digital platforms, of course, you know, uh, uh, you got Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, you know, uh, we're on iTunes, we're on Amazon, there's all kinds of you know, historychannel.com, you go to the history uh, app, I mean, we're all over the place. YouTube is a big deal. Um, for me, you come right to the shop. We get people plan their vacations and come to the shop and visit us. You know, we're in Reedsville, North Carolina. Rockingham County has been amazing to us. We're really accessible. Do an LS Fest in a couple of weeks. I'm at all kinds of events across the country. You want to meet me or you want to come by the shop, we're really accessible and I welcome anybody here anytime. Well, this has been a terrific, fun interview. So thank you so much, David. I've been joined by David Ankin, CEO and host of Toy Makers. David, thank you. Thank you for having us.